Hey everybody. Uh, so previously we were talking about the changes between states of solid, liquid, and gas by changing the temperature of the object. And when we change the temperature, we're altering the kinetic energy of the particles that make up that object. And I also indicated that one way that we can change whether something is a solid, liquid, or gas is by changing its pressure. And I never really went into what that meant because I was saving it for right now. So here I'm going to try to answer the question, what does pressure have to do with it? Now, just kind of recapping what I talked about earlier, states of matter can be changed by altering the temperature of the material, which changes how fast the particles are moving around that make up that material. And when we're changing how fast they're moving, we're changing how effective those particles are at holding, uh, holding close to one another using those um, electrostatic forces that I talked about. But also, we can change the state of a matter, the change, state of matter of an object, sorry about that, by changing the pressure that's pressing in on it. So for example, you are perfectly fine here on Earth because there's a certain amount of pressure being placed on you by the air around you. Now air itself does not weigh very much, but when you consider the fact that there are trillions and trillions of atoms between you and the upper atmosphere, all the weight of that air presses down on you and in part gives you the shape that you have. So if you want to go ahead and blame the air for the shape that you have, go ahead. Now, if I suddenly were to remove that and all the air were to go rushing out into outer space because we don't have an atmosphere, not only would you die because of the lack of oxygen, but also the sudden drop in pressure would cause dramatic changes to your body. So temperature and pressure are really linked when it comes to how something behaves and what state of matter it's in. So one of the examples that we have of this is called Boyle's Law. And I exam or gave you an example of this earlier in first semester when I took a marshmallow and I placed it in the vacuum chamber. Now that marshmallow kind of grows in size as I suck the air out of the chamber. And when I'm removing air from the chamber, I'm removing pressure off of that marshmallow. There are fewer air particles colliding with the marshmallow and kind of applying a force to keep it in its current shape. And when I remove those air particles, the marshmallow is free to expand outwards. The particles that make up the marshmallow get a little more active because less things are colliding with them. And one way that we summarize this is using what's called Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law is down here. It's pressure times volume in instance one is equal to pressure times volume in instance two. And when I mean instance, I'm talking about, so I start off with a balloon that has this much pressure and this much volume. If I change the volume of the balloon, you can then solve for the change in pressure. And so it, roughly if I double one, I have to half the other. There's a some really easy relationships you can find here. Now one example of Boyle's Law, and I've got this kind of simulation right here, you can see right over here there's a pressure meter. And if I was to increase the volume of my container, that pressure meter goes down pretty quickly. And there's more area for my air particles to kind of bounce around in. But if I rapidly bring this pressure, or I rapidly reduce the volume, there's less space for my air particles to bounce around in, you can see that my pressure bar is gradually getting higher and higher and higher. And as I continue to kind of press this gas in there, all of a sudden my pressure bar begins to spike. And when pressure begins to spike, we begin to see some really, really strange things. So not only would something compress under this much pressure, but we also see a change in temperature as well. And we can see that, oh, I missed this one. In your notebook, would you guys please go ahead and try out Boyle's Law using practice number one? Um, I'll be looking for that when I check notebooks. But as I was talking about, there's a re this relationship between temperature and pressure, and this is given to us using what we call the ideal gas law. So in, an, uh, in a gas, we can predict how temperature will change or be changed by a change in pressure and volume. And this is what we call the ideal gas law, which is PV is equal to NRT, and all of those letters you can find down here and what they mean. All gases have an R value, which is something that I have to give you in order for you to solve the problem. And the amount of gas is given in moles, another thing that I will give you to solve the problem. For those of you that were paying attention in chemistry, a mole is a certain amount of a chemical that we use. So using that formula, try to solve practice question number two. Given the following table, find the volume of three moles of standard air at 32 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 100,000 pascals. 
So you can find standard error down here on the table. You should be able to go ahead and solve that by plugging everything into the ideal gas law. So last but not least, just kind of exploring this relationship between temperature and pressure. If I combine the two, you will find that if I rapidly change the volume of a gas, I will not only change its pressure, but I will also dramatically change its temperature. In fact, it's actually possible to light paper on fire using something called a fire piston, which basically, and I've got this picture down here just to show you, basically it's just a piston that's uh, with sealed air in it. So there's air all the way in here, and I take a tiny piece of paper and I put it at the bottom. If I rapidly crush this thing, the increase in pressure actually increases the temperature of the gas so much that it lights the paper on fire, and you can see that kind of present in the picture right here. Um, another application of this, diesel engines don't actually have spark plugs. What they do is they simply rapidly change the volume of the air in the cylinder, and that actually causes the air to explode on its own. You don't need a spark plug to start a diesel engine. So, one last thing I would like you guys to try, if a, if a rapid decrease in volume creates an increase in the temperature of the air, what would you expect to happen if the volume of air is rapidly increased? So see if you can go ahead and answer that one. That'll be the third question I look for in your notebooks, and I will be continuing on with thermal physics in our next video.